And joining me now is Taleb Kuchikjan, who is a professor at the Marmara University and a former member of Parliament for the AK Party. Also in our studio, Vepik Baysan, who is a lecturer at the Ibn Khaldun University. And coming to us from Doha, Martin Reardon, a vice president of the Sufan Group and who's also spent two decades at the FBI. Okay, now before we get into, gentlemen, the impact of Khashoggi's possible death and what that is having on global politics, I just want us to break down a little bit more who are the main players in this ever-changing drama. Vebi, we're going to start with you. Let's begin with Jamal Khashoggi. Who is he and why would the Saudis want him silenced? Why was he considered such a threat? Well, first of all, he is a, a very prominent, uh, let's say, intellectual, because what we know about him, his uh, identity as a journalist, but he is more than a journalist, actually. He used to be the senior advisor in the palace, as well as in London uh, at the Saudi embassy and, and in the United States. And he was an outspoken person, although in many occasions he supported the uh, you know, uh, uh, king family uh, in Saudi Arabia. For example, uh, Saudi's attack on uh, Yemen, the Yemen war, he supported it. And he was also a fierce defender of uh, the uh, reforms uh, that actually uh, Prince Salman uh, was uh, kind of taking care of. But also he was upset and again a critic of uh, the, let's say, wrongdoings and that the Middle East need more uh, uh, freedom of speech as well as more human rights. So that, that he was really critical on that. So, but would this all what he did constitute uh, that he would be kind of uh, in a way like tricked entering the uh, consulate in Istanbul and then disappearance? Probably there is something more than that. One, what maybe is that he may have been uh, kind of under interrogation, things went wrong. Perhaps the team did not come really uh, just to execute him on a way, but it seems something went wrong. Mm, something and, seriously uh, something has gone Something seriously, wrong definitely. That's what uh, all, uh, you know, uh, what we hear. And uh, more importantly, probably they want to take him away. But whatever they wanted to do, they wanted to send a clear message to opposition anywhere in the world that mm. actually we can get you. And so that signifies because such a prominent intellectual being probably taken away and appearing in Riyadh would be a clear sign, but for them it didn't really matter. Mm. And if this is going to be a clear message, Talib, that message is likely to have come, some will say, from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He's only been in power for 16 months. How much influence does he really have? What kind of control does he exercise? I think let me underline the fact that if it was a message, I think that message has been backfired. It is very clear today because since the disappearance of Khashoggi, all the lights are now on uh, Saudi Arabia and the Crown Prince. It is very clear. Mm. Uh, yes, he is uh, in, in the control at the moment, but uh, for the last uh, 16 months, as you have said, initially uh, he was presented as a reformer and also a man who has a vision because they have published a paper for 2030 vision. It was an opening for Saudi Arabia, a country where traditional and patriarchal structures are there sociologically and politically. But what we can see from the unfolding events, because these events now are unfolding uh, before the uh, whole world, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing is hidden, nothing is secret. And I think the fingers are pointing at uh, Prince Salman and his associates. It's very clear. He seems to have the final say on so many things in Saudi Arabia these days, even though he is not yet the king, he seems to be the one pulling the strings. How likely is it that something like this could have happened without him knowing? Uh, it is very unlikely mm. that uh, such a thing might happen without his knowledge because what is clear uh, uh, as reported in the media is that uh, you know, 15 uh, men from Saudi Arabia came to Turkey. They were called a hitman and they, I think uh, they were responsible for the operation that took place. And I think this will not be uh, happen without the knowledge of a uh, leader. It's been uh, hinted by Trump, uh, President Trump, that a row uh, you know, people or guys might have done the uh, job. But it seems that um, it, we are talking about a country 
where the head of the uh, state or the crown, crown, uh, crown prince controls almost everything. Mm. It includes media, it includes media, uh, universities, intellectuals. I think it is very unlikely that without his knowledge, uh, this uh, operation could have taken place. Mm. Now, we are going to bring in uh, our guest who is joining us from Doha. Martin, thank you so much for your time. I want to bring you in here because you have such a long background with criminal investigations from your time with the FBI. Saudi Arabia has been known in the past to dispose of its critics, but we've never seen international waves of condemnation like we have this time around. What makes this case so different? Well, I think there's a couple of things. We have seen this before, just not with Saudi Arabia so publicly. But if you look at what's happened in the last 15 months or so, uh, Russia has ordered the execution of dissidents or critics of the, the Putin administration in the United Kingdom. North Korea had ordered the execution of uh, their leader's brother in Malaysia, uh, who was a critic of that government. Uh, so we've seen this before. And I think some of this could be signals given by the White House that uh, what matters now are alliances and that the White House has more of a tolerance for autocrats and basically giving the green light for, for acts like this with little repercussion. Let's talk about the investigation a little bit more here, specifically these leaks to the media that we just keep seeing almost on a daily basis. Throughout this case, we're hearing Turkish officials, Turkish sources have leaked information to prominent publications and broadcasters. It seems as if the media isn't able to access official information. There have been no press conferences from the police, on site, outside the consulate, which we may have expected to see. What is behind that kind of drip feed tactic, do you think? Is this a way for Turkish investigators to shape the global impression of this investigation? Well, yes, it is. And this is just not Turkey. This, this happens in large investigations with a number, number of countries. There are leaks. Some of them are probably sanctioned by the state, other ones perhaps not. But they're giving out this information bit by bit. But the story really hasn't changed since the very first day. The Turkish government, within a matter of hours, said that they thought, publicly, that they thought Hushul, he went in there uh, and was killed. Uh, then the question came up, how are they getting this? And then the, the question of an audio tape, uh, perhaps coming from his Apple Watch, was, was one uh, leak that came out. There are other ways that they can get that information from inside the, um, from inside the consulate or an embassy. A Turkish intelligence service is very sophisticated. They've been a member of NATO for a number of decades. So they've had access to uh, both the technology and uh, the expertise or, or, or the training. Uh, so. This is a deliberate leak of information to keep it in the news and to sort of put the Saudi government in a corner. When this comes out, how do you deny these things? What does the Turkish government really know and what don't they know? Mm. Eventually, after the Saudi government comes out with their statement, the Turkish government, I think, is going to make public what they have. It'll be interesting when they do finally come public with that. But Talib, I want to uh, discuss with you the relationship between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. It's often been a tense political relationship, but it is a very important economic one. I think in just the last year, there have been 800 Saudi companies looking or currently investing in Turkey. With those competing relationships in mind, how different is this for Turkey to investigate? Well, of course, this is a very sensitive issue for, Tur for Turkey. On the one hand, you would like to see the reality coming out, what happened to Kashikchi, and I think Turkish investigators are uh, doing quite a well, qu quite a good job, uh, but this job, of course, uh, can take place properly only if Saudi Arabia officials can cooperate, because uh, that happened in a consulate that is the land of Saudi Arabia, mm. and I think it took fi almost 15 days to get in both the consulate and the, also the residence of the consul general. So these are uh, some complicated matters, and Turkey cannot take action on its own. You have to cooperate with, the, with Saudi Arabia according to the international law. But on the other hand, I think there is an uh, understanding between Turkey and Saudi Arabia now that uh, a light should be shed on this, uh, on this event. And the, uh, President Erdogan and uh, Prince Selman, uh, I think, talked to on the phone. Uh, there is a full cooperation as far as I can see. Uh, but the outcome, I think, is quite an important one because uh, I think the priority for Turkey will 
uh, be to see what happened to uh, Khashoggi because this might uh, uh, you know, set a precedent for, for other countries mm. if Turkey remains silent on this issue. In my mind, Turkey will not remind, remain silent, as you have said. Uh, the evidence is now time to time shared with the, with the media. I think, yes, Turkey will, of course, uh, look at the relations with Saudi Arabia. It is a strange relationship uh, recently because of Turkey's uh, uh, cooperation with Qatar and its involvement in the Syrian affairs, etc. Mm. But on the whole, Turkey and Saudi Arabia uh, enjoyed a very fruitful relationship in the past, especially from an economic point of view. Bepi, if we look forward then, I mean, Saudi Arabia is such a powerful nation, not least of all because of its control over the oil uh, that so many countries rely on. Going forward, can you see this investigation, this particular drama affecting Turkey and Saudi Arabia's relationship going forward? Well, actually, it may be an opportunity to uh, put the relation which was suffering in the last couple of years uh, between Turkey and Saudi Arabia, it may be an opportunity to put on the right track this incident, unfortunate incident, so it, because we should separate, uh, you know, wrongdoings from blaming a total nation, which what we see from Saudi Arabia, I mean, I joined in the Arabic TVs, etc. What that's what I realized that they're blaming the entire Turkey, Turkish administration, but Turkey has nothing to do with this issue. So that's a normal reaction, but I think this should be used as an opportunity, and actually Turkey and the uh, Saudi Arabia uh, actually great two actors in the region and they should uh, work the regional peace and prosperity. Now, uh, we have uh, the Prince actually just announced the NEOM project, which is $500 billion uh, project uh, concerning Jordan and also Palestine, Egypt and North Western part of Saudi Arabia and Turkey should definitely be part of it and uh, and also play a significant role on that so i'm just very much hoping that you know these two countries will put this behind mm -hmm. and uh, work forward. together what about oil saudi arabia has said if it suffers strong retaliation it can use oil as a weapon that means then that globally everyone feels the pain then doesn't it well indeed but i think that was a wrong sort of statement by saudi arabia I mean, it's a fact that <clears throat> they're at the edge of uh, bankruptcy. And like uh, three years ago, IMF said that if Saudi Arabia goes, continues this way, within five years, they will really suffer financially because all prices were very well down, like $20, $22 per barrel. And now it is uh, $70 or $60, but it's not yet enough to boost their economy. So I think they shouldn't use uh, petrol uh, as, a, as a weapon because it's not going to work out because they do not always define the price of the petrol. There's an international, uh, let's say, uh, you know, kind of decision makers on that. We're just going to take a break from our discussions to have a look at how the ties between US and Turkey have been affected by this. Now, the United States has been thrust into this crisis as its role as Saudi Arabia's most important ally comes under intense scrutiny. The messages coming from the White House have been mixed, with President Trump initially siding with Riyadh's denials to acknowledging that Khashoggi probably has been killed. This puts Turkey's relations with the US in an uncomfortable bind just a week after the two sides cleared a major sticking point in relations. Basil Rehan tells us how all that came into play after Turkey released US pastor Andrew Brunson after more than two years in detention. For Andrew, it's been a very interesting day because, as you probably heard, I said a little bit earlier, from a Turkish prison to the White House in 24 hours. That's not bad. Actually. A US pastor at the center of a diplomatic crisis now home and at the White House, offering praise to the U.S. President. Make him a great blessing to this country. Andrew Brunson's return was described by President Donald Trump as a diplomatic victory. The evangelical missionary had been in detention in Turkey for two years. Brunson was convicted of a terror-related charge and sentenced to three years in prison, but was immediately released by the court for time already served.
Brunson's detention dates back to a failed coup attempt in Turkey in 2016. He was arrested in the investigation that followed. The pastor was accused of being a spy with links to PKK terrorists and followers of Fethullah Gulen. Gulen lives in self-imposed exile in the American state of Pennsylvania. He's a cleric and businessman who Turkey accuses of being behind the coup attempt. Turkey has been petitioning the U.S. for his extradition, while the U.S. has resisted, citing a lack of evidence. That has been a major source of friction between the two NATO allies, with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan accusing the West of supporting the coup plotters. Throughout his proceedings, Andrew Brunson, a resident of Turkey for more than two decades, consistently maintained his innocence. U.S. officials argued his detention was politically motivated that Ankara was using him as a bargaining chip in its campaign to extradite Gulen, an allegation Turkey has always denied. Back in August, the tension over Brunson's case escalated. The US imposed sanctions on two senior Turkish government officials, followed a week later by tariffs on Turkish steel and aluminium. The US decision sent Turkey's currency into freefall. Ankara responded with tariffs of its own on a range of U.S. products. Now, with Brunson's release, there's hope the relationship is on the mend. Turkey and the U.S. have numerous mutual interests, ranging from trade, to combating terrorism, to finding a resolution to the Syrian war. But other sources of strain remain. Among them, there's Turkey's purchase of a Russian-made missile defense system. Ankara says the deal is done, which has upset the U.S. Then there's the case of NASA scientist Serkan Golge, a dual U.S.-Turkish national. He's serving a five-year prison term on terror charges, the U.S. says without credible evidence. While Pastor Andrew Brunson's return to the U.S. marks a significant step towards reconciliation, the question is whether it's also a sign of new will and momentum to restore confidence in a troubled relationship. Basil Rahan, Straight Talk. So we're going to continue our discussion on the disappearance of Khashoggi. I'm going to turn to Talib. I want to ask you about Turkey and United States re current relationship. It seemed like they were on the brink of rebuilding what has been a strained relationship with the release of the evangelical pastor Andrew Brunson. Those optimistic hopes of greater cooperation don't really seem to have been borne out during this investigation. What impact do you think this Khashoggi case will have on the ties between the U.S. and Turkey? I think as far as we can see, I think U.S. Uh, uh, also offered some help in terms of sharing intelligence or some other uh, 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 assistance for investigation. They and, haven't been particularly right. forthcoming, though, have they? Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, this uh, is not a, a defining, I think, issue as far as relations between Turkey uh, and the U.S. is concerned. There are some other issues that are much more important. Yes, uh, I think if the whole world can come together and then cooperate on this issue, not to cover up that issue, that's very important. And I think Turkey is not going to cover up. That's my uh, belief. And, but when you look at the signals from the United States, there are, I think, you know, conflicting signals. Some say, well, we have a you know, large amount of in, uh, investment and also agreement. We are going to sell them you know, 100 billions of uh, dollars of weapon. We should not you know, uh, hurt this kind of relationship. Uh, I think Turkey is not on that track. Turkey says, you know, the truth should come out of it uh, at the expense, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the relations between Turkey and U.S. are, I think, uh, uh, influenced by, by other factors. The release of Branson uh, has been a welcome issue but by both sides, I think. Uh, so this is a starting issue, but there are some other issues that are related to Syria, mm -hmm. uh, you know, support of U.S. to uh, P PYD, YPG. There's still uh, a yes, lot for them and, to, and, yes, to be able to work through. also Turkey's relations with Russia uh, and mm -hmm. also Iran. These are the issues I think Turkey and United States will be talking about when, uh, for, for the future, mm -hmm. not the Khashoggi issue. Martin, I just want to ask another question to you. The United States has done quite a good job sitting on the fence of this issue. We've had the President Donald Trump supporting Saudi Arabia's denials, then coming out saying that perhaps Khashoggi is dead after all. He has been quite tempered in his response. Why? Why does Saudi Arabia exercise so much power when it comes to the United States? I think it, then it, it goes again uh, with the Trump administration. Saudi Arabia is a very important ally. Mohammed bin Salman is 
for all intents and purposes, the leader of that country. And the Trump administration wants to have that close relation with Saudi Arabia and not do anything to jeopardize that relationship for a number of things. One, Saudi Arabia is the, the leading uh, exporter of oil in the world, and that has a major effect on global markets, not so much on the U.S. demand for oil, but on the global markets. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a, a major player in the U.S. Uh, strategy to contain uh, Iranian influence. Um, and then, of course, you've got the U.S. defense cells. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the largest buyer of U.S. defense uh, materials, aircraft, weapon systems, technology. I want uh, to ask you about that defense Trump does not deal. Want to jeopardize that. Is it? Does it send the wrong message? Donald mm -hmm. Trump's continued support of Saudi Arabia citing this arms deal. Does it send the wrong message to maybe other authoritarian regimes in that region that you can effectively buy your way out of um, well, consequences? Out, uh, no, so it does send out that conflicting message. But 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 the United States is, is careful on this. Um, if Saudi Arabia does not buy those defense goods from the United States. They're going to buy them from Russia or they're going to buy them from China. Both those countries are trying to break into that market. The United States does not want to do that because they don't want Russia or China to have a greater influence in the Gulf region. So they're, they're looking at the bigger picture. Maybe not from a publicity standpoint. I don't think the Trump administration is handling this correctly because they're still giving the benefit of the doubt to Mohammed bin Salman. But they're looking at the bigger picture of the importance of that U.S.-Saudi relationship for a number of reasons, oil, Iran, Russia and China. Mm. All right, Vepi, we're going to give the last word on this discussion to you as we now turn back to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He was seen in the West as the great reformer here, Donald Trump's son-in-law and Middle East uh, peace negotiator Jared Kushner is one of his biggest champions. How much has his international image been damaged by this and can he come back from it? Well, a lot. I think he heavily invested on this image. Saudi Arabia's image uh, never been better uh, until that incident, actually. Uh, you can see that they're getting uh, a lot of advice from international companies and all that. Very carefully uh, kind of crafted steps uh, taken. Um, and he has to get back. But it's not only international image. First of all, he has to solidify his power within Saudi Arabia. This is the main problem because line of succession changed in 2015. His father became uh, crown prince and later the king. And then he uh, kind of removed Mohammed bin Naif and appointed his own son. So these are all created a lot of negative energy in Saudi Arabia. So therefore, they were uh, very careful on that, handling internal issues. As you remember last year, a lot of people got arrested, etc. Mm -hmm. And the world just sat and watched. What the, and, and, and among them was quite prominent investors. So international image is very, very important for them. I think they will do their best to gain it back. But from the international perspective, especially from the United States point of view, Saudi Arabia should remain as a country in one piece because any internal uh, kind of collapse will jeopardize uh, uh, the region, the Middle East. So therefore, probably they will ignore many of the things and they will do their best to bring back the prince. Mm, there is so much at stake. It's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out on the diplomatic and uh, international political fronts. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us on Straight Talk.